Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Today, I am by, joined by Dr. Serena. Now, how can I pronounce this? Because I get everybody's name wrong. Is it Badako? Badako? Bauduko. Baduko. Bauduko. I should yep. have broken into two parts. Bauduko. Yep. Yeah. Where, where's, that, where, where's that name from, Serena? Is that, a, is that a Scandinavian name? It sounds a bit Italian. No, no that's Italian, yeah. Oh, so are you, have you got Italian heritage as well as Swedish? Oh, I'm, I'm from Italy. So I grew oh. up in Turin. Yeah. And then I moved to Sweden. Oh, apologies. I do apologize because many people, you know, often mistake me for being English or Scottish or Canadian. And so I hate when I get things wrong. So excuse me. I do apologize. I thought you were Swedish originally. Apologies. You, <laughs> you look a bit Scandinavian. That's why you don't look like a typical do, Italian yeah. person. <laughs> and I probably feel more like I'm Scandinavian than I'm Italian, uh, but a bit shy for being Italian, no, they say. But yeah. <laughs> so when did, when did you move from Italy to Sweden? Uh, so in 2009. So okay, I've been so you were, like, you, were, you were like four years of age. <laughs> <laughs> Should I answer that question? Uh, I was a- around 20. <laughs> Around 20. Okay. All right. So you grew up in Italy, yeah. in Turin. Turin is famous for the Shroud of Turin, isn't it? Where it's supposed to be the Shroud, where it's like the, the cloth that was on Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's the maybe something that you would know about Turin. And then uh, Lavazza, the coffee. Oh, yeah. And that's from Turin. Fiat, the cars. Oh, yeah. Fiat. Are from Turin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fiat, Fiat's not very... Sorry, go ahead. I was thinking about the football teams as well. Oh, I don't Juventus. follow soccer. I would know. I, and... I've heard of Juventus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't follow soccer, so I wouldn't. If a, if a famous footballer walked past me, I wouldn't know who they were. <laughs> yeah, no, me neither. It's <laughs> just the, the ones I have to know because they are from my city. <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots of uh, lots of Fiat cars in Ireland, but not many Fiats here in Australia. And mm. when when we would grow up, we would say that what Fiat stood for F I A T. Fix it again tomorrow because it will break down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. yeah. I yeah. never saw a Fiat breakdown, so I don't know. Okay. You so, don't see that many in Sweden yeah. either. <laughs> well, the last time I, uh, I was in Sweden in 2019, beautiful country, by the way. Absolutely um, great, great country. I'd highly recommend anybody to go and visit there. Not only is it beautiful, people are friendly, it's easy to get around, everybody speaks English, probably speak English better than I do. The only downfall about Scandinavia that I think a lot of people struggle with is the price. It's very expensive. Mm, yeah. yeah, that's the only thing. But it's a beautiful place to visit. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely yeah. great. And thinking, Stockholm is beautiful. Yeah. I was thinking about the light as well. During winter, it's really dark. Yeah, I went in September. It wasn't too bad. Actually, my placemats on my desk right here, these black ones, unfortunately, they've worn off. But you may vaguely see the outline of the crowns. Oh. Now, they, I bought them actually at the gift shop at, the, at like the castle in Stockholm. And yeah. I bought a pack of them and I have them in my office on my desk as coasters. But my nice. drinks have, you have wore a piece of Sweden, piece of Sweden in your office. <laughs> in my office, uh, but it's wore off the um, it's wore off the that there was three crowns and I can see still the see the indent. And then we have some little glass things in our living room as well. They're like little Viking ships and glass. Yeah, which are yeah, the classic okay. tourist, the classic tourist mm. thing, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the tragic tourist. Yeah. So you you're based in Stockholm then, Serena? No, I'm in oh, Örebro, again. which is uh is I wouldn't expect you to know where it is, but it's kind of in between Stockholm and Oslo. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I went to Oslo and I didn't like Oslo. Oh really? Yeah, I had a bit of a I don't know, maybe it was just a bad experience. We stayed in the city center. I found the city center to be extremely dirty. Um oh, okay. there was lots of gangs of um homeless people or gypsy people getting around begging and trying to rob people <laughs> oh really yeah yeah yeah. The, but what i did like about oslo was we went to this museum that had a replication of all the viking ships mm. that was absolutely fantastic um and then we went to bergen as well yeah um which is really i think bergen might be the lost city of atlantis because there's that much rain in bergen and might as well be underwater <laughs> I have never seen so much rain in all my life. Yeah, really. Yeah, I haven't been there, but I'd like to. Yeah, I did the uh, Bergen 10K, 10 kilometer city run. And um, 
yeah, I came back absolutely soaking wet. My wife was like, what happened here? The rain was torrential. So yeah, but it's a very <laughs> nice little town. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. So um, have you always lived in that town since you moved to Sweden or have you moved around or are you just there for work? Um, this has been my home city in Sweden. So that's where I've been mostly. So what made you move to Sweden from Italy? Um, so I was an exchange student uh, through yeah. the Erasmus program. Yeah. Uh, so I was supposed to do just one term here and then it turned into a year and then I didn't really want to go home. So I just <laughs> got stuck here and continued my studies here. And hmm. yeah. And like most Europeans, very good at languages. Do you speak Swedish now? I do. Yeah. So you speak Italian, you speak Swedish, you speak English, and you research and publish in English as well. Any other languages? Uh, no, not any other languages, but you could also say that <laughs> I speak three languages and none is really good <laughs> because <laughs> I'm forgetting Italian and I'm mixing up all the other ones. <laughs> Don't worry, I still struggle with English, so it's okay. You're doing well. You're doing a lot better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I would struggle, yeah. So, um, Serena, um, so obviously yeah, you grew up in, in, in Italy, as you said, and then moved to Sweden. But what were you interested in when you were younger? Were you were you always into science? Was this something you wanted to do? Did you want to get into the area of chronobiology and sleep science? Or what was your goal growing up at school? Um, I think the um, big interest that I had very early on was in psychology. So more, more of um, studying people and understanding people's behaviors. Uh, um, so I think sleep came after when I started my PhD. I was... I got interested into research when I started studying here in Sweden because the um, programs here are really focused on research and evidence-based things, uh, which I didn't really experience in my first year studying in, in Italy. Um, and then I kind of by chance, I got this PhD and it was about adolescent sleep. And okay. then I got really interested into this and I wouldn't leave it because there are so many unanswered questions and it's such an interesting topic. Yeah, adolescent sleep. Yeah, it's quite, um, adolescent sleep can be a very uh, emotive topic for a lot of people because parents think that the adolescent is just lazy and just wants to sleep and don't want to do anything. And then the adolescent yeah. actually feels very tired. And it's 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 actually kind of weird. And obviously their chronotype is slightly out because they've become more of an owl chronotype. But it's, I find it somewhat odd that like every human has gone through this phase yeah. and every adult forgets what it was like when they were a teenager. And so sometimes when we talk to adults about this, maybe in their 40s or 50s and go, well, when you were 15 or 16, what was your sleep like? Oh, I, I was awake till two o'clock in the morning. I was awake till you know, at three o'clock in the morning, but we, yeah, we seem to true. forget. Yeah it's, yeah, it's it's kind of a strange area, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That, that's true. And like you say, most adolescents go through this and even animals, we've been studying and seeing that they also go through these changes. So we should kind of know that it's normal, but it's a lot of education and talking about the fact that it's not being lazy. It's really a lot of changes happening. Mm -hmm. So we should just give these teenagers a break. Lay off the teenagers. Yeah, the schools maybe start later. This kind maybe of stuff. no, maybe maybe no school. <laughs> maybe no school. <laughs> it's really not the time to go to school. They have so many other things going yeah. on. <laughs> maybe kids should just be given money and let them play video games and do what they like. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know. <laughs> you heard this it here from Doc, <laughs> Dr. Sarita said you should stay at home and not go to school. <laughs> That's what someone will chop out a podcast and say. Um. So you you did this PhD looking at adolescent sleep, and then you did some time in Australia as well in Adelaide, I think. Did you yeah. during your PhD? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, sure. So after my PhD, I uh, contacted Michael Gradisar in Adelaide, and I really wanted to do a postdoc with him um, because I was getting very interested in to the association between technology use and sleep in teenagers. And uh, he had a wonderful lab um, at Flinders Uni, so I wanted to go there and do some experimental studies. Uh, and so we finally got this grant, uh, which is an international postdoc. And so I did uh, one and a half years in Adelaide. And uh, we did an experimental study that I'm still 
um, I'm still looking at the data, uh, but it was um, it was really a lot of fun. So we had teenage girls coming to the lab and we were kind of manipulating what they were doing. They were coming with a friend to the lab yeah. and then we were uh, on one evening, they had access to chatting with a friend and on the other evening they didn't. So we were really looking into peer relationships, friendship, how um, another pers having another person to chat with affects your technology use. Is that worse than just watching TV, for example? Uh, so really getting into not only technology use, but also the social aspect. Hmm. Any findings you can share with us? Um, yeah, I, I, I can easily say that there was not a big difference. So uh, we compared Netflix plus chatting with a friend versus only Netflix. And there was a 10 minute difference and there was a lot of variation. So some mm -hmm. girls went to bed earlier when they had the friend and some girls went to bed later. So it really varies. And again, some people may say that people are up all night talking with their friends and this is stopping them going to sleep. So this may be answer this question that maybe for some people having that company and comfort may actually help them go to bed earlier. So it depends on the person. Yeah, definitely. And one interesting thing was that friendship quality was uh, one of the uh, important factors. So the higher the friendship quality, the later they went to bed. So there is something into staying up for your friend. But mm. then some girls were also talking about, I feel so comfortable with my friend, I can simply go to bed. So it's really, it's yeah, really yeah. complex. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And how do you measure friendship quality? Uh, so we had a questionnaire um, and so we were asking specifically about your friend. Um, is your friend someone you feel comfortable telling secrets to? Is your friend someone um, you have fun with? And a lot of questions about different aspects, so trusting each other, uh, having fun with each other, um, going to this person when you have a problem, knowing that she will be still there if you have a fight and these kind of questions. So. Mm. Very interesting. You see, these are all the wonderful aspects that where sleep is going into. We're, we're encroaching in all these different areas. And this is what makes this feel, I think, so interesting, that sleep is now starting to be looked at in, so many, in combination with so many other disciplines. Um, on, a, on a slightly related but different topic, we are, we're currently writing up about five papers at the moment looking at the relationship between uh, dreams, nightmares, death anxiety, and spirituality. And it's very interesting because we're going to put an abstract in for the Australasian Sleep Association. And one of the things we did find is that death anxiety in the cohort that you're looking at, young mm -hmm. females, was extremely high. So in younger people, death anxiety is higher than older people, which you think it would be the other way around. As we get older, we get more afraid of dying, yeah. but no, it's the other yeah. way around. And this is consistent with the literature as well. And then within those groups, females statistically more of females will have more death anxiety compared to males. So mm -hmm. this may align with Jonathan Haidt's work in the US as well, who wrote that book, The Cognitive of the American Mind, with more anxiety and death anxiety. Um, he didn't specifically talk about death anxiety, but anxiety in young female girls, um, young females, um, young female uh, yeah, girls. So, so this is an interesting area, but also yeah. was associated with more nightmares as well and disturbing dreams, mm -hmm. um, which also... We've now found as well as a relationship between mental health, yeah. nightmares, and death anxiety. So there's a correlation between those three things. So it's interesting, That's like interesting. Um, as yeah. a new area as well to look at. And it's never been looked at before to our knowledge. So yeah, mm. this is like this is the this is the wonderful thing about sleep and quantum biology. It's going out into all different facets of the world and being combined and crossing over into different disciplines. And this is where I think we have some really fruitful findings coming forward. Yeah, definitely. And that's what I mean, that I wouldn't leave this field because there are so many interesting questions to be answered. Yeah, heaps. Yeah, I've got like 15 things I'm working on at the moment outside my business <laughs> and about, about 100 other ideas. You know, I could just easily, you know, do this forever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, someone asked me a few weeks ago, it was a big, um, you know, lottery here, like a big jackpot, mm -hmm. like 150 million. And I'm like, yeah. what would you do if you won it? And I was like, I would just do research. I would just sit here and do research because it's just so fascinating, you know? I don't, it's not yeah. like a job to me. Like, it's, you know, it's fun. Mm. It's really fun. So it's good. Yeah. Oh, so Serena, what, what job are you in now? What's your, what's your current role now? 
Um, so I um, actually have two jobs. So uh, fifty percent I'm doing research um, at the uh, Odebrecht University. Um, so I'm working within a project um, where we got some money from uh, the Swedish government, um, which is about uh, sleep programs, two different sleep pro programs in the school for teenagers. And so we are looking at um, one longer sleep education program versus a shorter one, which is really focused on uh, mobile use in the evening. Um, and we're trying to see which one works best in the long run. So we are following these teenagers for one year. Um, so that's what I'm doing part time, and the rest of the time I'm I'm working um, in the for a governmental organization and doing some research really close to practice, so really close to schools. So, so they come to us when they want to evaluate what they are doing. Is this working? What does the research say? What should we do if we have bowling in school, for example? Oh, yeah. So. So your research. work, your work is really applied. It's not like kind of theoretical laboratory based work. You're really looking for practical solutions in the field that are going to help people. Yeah, 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 I would say so. And then one other part of my research is also trying to understand mechanisms and mm -hmm. uh, doing these more longitudinal studies, uh, the, the link between sleep and mental health in teenagers, and also technology use and uh, sleep. So I'm doing a bit of. <laughs> both yeah, i would yeah. say a bit of everything yeah excellent yeah and well, i, I really love the experimental studies so i would like to do that more yeah i think that's where that's where it's really interesting when you start um collecting and analyzing you know real life data or putting interventions into real life situations uh, i'm the same as well i'm i would be bored in a laboratory and um, i would like i'd like to be doing stuff sort of out in the field you know like not not stuck in a lab yeah i know and i know some people <laughs> love that and that's great but for me it's not it's not the case I, I think I, I do like the combination and then taking these ideas out in the field and seeing what happens in real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can test them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's um let's jump into this paper because this is gonna be the focus of our conversation today. So recently, um well it's kind of I think it's really ahead of print, really, isn't it? Because it's gonna come out um in oh sorry, yeah, it was accepted in April. Uh, it's available online um as of 15th of April, and this is uh, the end of May now recording. Um, but I think it's down as August 2024 in Sleep Medicine Reviews, volume 76. And so this is a great paper, and we will put the link for this in the show notes. You can freely read this, so it's not behind a paywall, which is great. And this, um, like all good scientific papers, we have a nice big meaty title. And so this one is called A Bidirectional Model of Sleep and Technology Use, a theoretical review of how much, for whom, and which mechanisms. Now, this is an interesting area, Serena, because over the last sort of 10, 15 years, there's been lots of discussion about electronic devices, smartphones, tablets, video games, TV, and we see these articles in newspapers. We see people on social media or podcasts talking about, you know, electronic devices are bad and these things are ruining people's brains and eyes and keeping people awake and causing ADHD and anxiety, and the list goes on and on and on. But yet we continue to use them, and they continue to grow in society because they're a useful tool, and so they have a benefit as well. The other yeah. side of the coin is that they're opening up access to lots of information via YouTube. We can educate people via these things as well. People can organize their life, travel, be on the go, do work. Like There's so many benefits to it as well. But it seems to get kind of vilified as well as being something that's really bad. Um, yeah. So... What led you to kind of to look at this area and, and what was the kind of genesis or the start of this paper? Yeah, I was thinking about that. And um, I think um, in, in particular, we were working on a study where we were asking teenagers whether they use their uh, smartphone as a way to help them distract themselves from negative thoughts. So it was a very mm. specific question uh, and 63% of them responded, yes, mm. I do use sometimes or always my phone as a distraction from negative thoughts in the evening. Um, and so it was really clear that there is something else to this and it's more nuanced than uh, we probably hear um, 
people talking about this topic. So um, we've also done some studies about the bidirectional link between sleep and technology use. So looking over time, is the one predicting the other or is it a bidirectional link? So sleep uh, predicts later technology use and technology use predicts later sleep problems. Can we just stop on that that on that definition there, bidirectional? Because some people may have not not have heard of that before or understand what it is. So are we saying here that basically if you don't get enough sleep, you may use your technology device more to to keep you awake and alert. Or if you use a technology device um more, it actually might stop you from going to sleep because the delay of sleep or replace the sleep time. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Or more that if you have problems falling asleep, then you would use your technology because what do you do? We are still mm. waiting to fall yeah, asleep yeah. and that might be a way to relax or to distract yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, we really felt like we needed to um, work on this theoretical model because the theoretical models that have been developed in 2010, they've been slightly updated, but there was no update adding this uh, other direction of effect. Um, and also... Uh, the mechanisms explaining the link between technology use and sleep. There are there have been quite a few studies since 2010, uh, which were looking at the bright light. Is it the content? What is it really that is um, so disruptive in using technology uh, for our sleep? And so it really it, it really felt like it was time to give an update. Mm. Excellent. All right. So um, in the background of the paper, the introduction, you do talk about these earlier theoretical models, kind of, and you've just kind of summarized it there as well. And there's been recent reviews. And as you said, there's been lots of research in this area, lab-based, field-based. Um, there's been some in uh, athletes that I've done myself and Madison Jones have done as well. Um, can you just tell us overall, um, in your own words, like, do you, is, is there a clear, is there a clear, like, I suppose, signal in the data, or is it like 90% of papers show that electronic devices are bad for sleep, or is it split, or what's your kind of general summary of what's currently happening before you updated this model and had a look? Um, I would say that it's really mixed. So some studies find an association and other fi studies find uh, an association. The association doesn't seem to be that big. It's not mm -hmm. the biggest factor uh, if you if you look at uh, several different uh, risk factors for sleep, this is not the biggest one. Uh, so there was a really nice meta-analysis uh, that Kate Bartel wrote a few years ago, where she looked at different aspects. This was specifically for for teenagers, but um, I mean, parents uh, had a bigger effect. For for example, alcohol use had a bigger effect compared to technology, mm -hmm. um, but. It's also it's it, the the thing I would say is that it's very complex, um, because you know there are so many different aspects. What, what why is it that um, we are sleeping less if we use our our smartphones or other technological devices, and for whom who is more sensitive? There might be some vulnerabilities that make some people more sensitive to that. Um, yeah, so in general, I would say it's not as clear cut as um, we've been hearing. So it's not just just mm. removing all your devices from the bedroom, I would say. Yeah, and, and and that's good to know because I think sometimes the media blows some of these papers or these um, scientific studies, you know, they sort of kind of, I don't know, blow them out of proportion because they're just... I don't know. I think it's just clickbait for some of them. I, like, I remember my very first study looked at electronic devices, actually, um, that I published in my PhD. And it was looking at the effect of the removal of electronic devices for 48 hours in elite judo athletes at the Australian Institute of Sport. And we found no effect. But it was probably the fact that, you know, highly trained athletes, very young um, our groups were sort of mixed because, you know, it was generally the, the males that gave up their electronic devices for 48 hours. The females didn't. Um, mm -hmm. They were also awoken very early the next day for training. So this may be curtailing the sleep opportunity that they were getting as well. So there were so many additional factors as well. But yeah. the Australian paper here blew it out of proportion. Study finds at the Australian Institute of Sport that electronic devices have no impact on sleep. And my Twitter, like at the time when I was on Twitter, was like just blowing up and on Facebook and people were like, this is wrong. This is useless. This, like, it's like people get crazy about it. Like, and then 
we did a yeah. a bit of a clip on the news for it, and I think the, the clip had something like, I don't know, it was something crazy. Like I, I, I it was in the thousands anyway. Well, let's say the clip had five thousand views, but it had like twenty five thousand comments. So like most people weren't even looking oh, at the content. Wow. I just commented on it. And there was all these arguments about. Like, saying these teenagers are just lazy this researcher doesn't know what he's talking about I bet he doesn't have kids he's just he's getting funded by the government he's getting funded by tech companies I'm like what are you like what is going on here like people were just going absolutely crazy it was really oh, wow. interesting to watch and I was just looking at it going I'm not commenting here because this is just mm. absolutely I it yeah. was really interesting to watch how people get so emotive about this topic so yeah mm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and also this uh, knowing a, a clear cut answer: is it black or is it white? And yeah, you yeah. can't really say that because, yeah. as you were saying, it's a special population, it's a special yeah. situation, maybe, and there are some nuances. So yeah. yeah. Exactly, and look, that's the other thing as well for people who listen to this podcast and as uh, podcast and as we well know as well, Serena. And I've had when I've done radio interviews before or other things as well or talk to people, I get nearly like accused oh, scientist, you never just give an answer. You're always like, it depends. I'm like, there is no clear yeah. cut answer. There, yeah. there is infinite shades of gray. This is like, there's. An, if someone tells you that this is bad and this is good, be wary because most things are not like that in life. Right. So yeah, if someone exactly. says to you, mm, maybe if these factors are here, this might be not so good. If this occurs, it might be a little bit good. But when someone goes to you, don't eat this and don't eat that, I think there you should be a bit afraid. Special. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was interviewed by a radio in, in Australia when I was there. Um, and it was about this study that, that I was talking about, uh, about teenagers using technology maybe as a help to, to distract themselves from yeah. um, rumination and worries. And they were saying, um, okay, so research is, researchers are just changing their minds. <laughs> All the yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> that was their conclusion. <laughs> but the thing is, that is science. Science is a self-correcting model, and it should change the whole time. That is the beauty yeah. about the scientific method. And if you follow it, you will continually, you know, find things that contradict even your own findings. But if you're a yeah. good scientist, you will keep doing that and keep chasing the truth. You won't kind of just go, this is my position, that's it. The position or the evidence is as it currently stands. Now, I think actually in some ways over the last few years, what we've had is through many different things, we've had politicians and non-scientists take that information and make it as if like everything is just like, bang, it's a line in the sand. This is what it is. And don't question it. Where yeah. the scientists themselves, if you're a good scientist, you're not going to be like that. You should be continually checking and testing your data. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have a good example in this paper because we're talking about uh, Matthew Walker, um, oh, yeah. who was um, he was uh, actually in I think in his book he was talking about the bright light, for example, and uh, that that that's probably very likely a mechanism. And he was citing um, a study that did find a difference, even though it wasn't um, a, a really big effect. And he changed his mind afterwards uh, uh, with the new studies coming out and and I, I think he's just such a good example because then he's been saying that you know I'm not a politician and I I can change my mind because there is new evidence coming in yeah. but the question is also how long does it take for this to translate to the public so that they also yeah. see this shift we have yeah. new information and um, we can and think this is, differently. This this is the danger about creating content in this space that it can become outdated very quickly, very quickly. I've often given, you know, talks or lectures at different companies and, and people put their hand and go, you were here four years ago and you said this. I went, yeah, no. And it's changed. Yeah. And they're like, what? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it changes. Yeah. Like, you know, we're not the same. I'm yeah. also a lot older and a lot grayer. So I changed too. We all changed. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Serena, let's jump into this a little bit more now. So let's look at some of these yeah. mechanisms. And you touched on one right there now, um, which was the bright light hypothesis. So yeah. when we talk about bright light, what exactly are we talking about? Because people talk about sunlight is good for sleep. It synchronizes you. People talk about mm -hmm. blue light, red light, white light, video gaming right. light, TV light. So what's the difference? What's going on here all this light? Yeah, so that's a very good question because um, the, the, it's true that the light is is good for our sleep, but uh, it depends on when. So mm. uh, to to keep your circadian rhythm so that you will fall asleep at the at the decent time in the evening, then it's good with bright light in in the morning. Uh, so for example, for 
teenagers or other uh, people that are uh, experiencing delayed sleep wake face disorder, then they would get bright light in the morning to be able to anticipate their sleep and shift their sleep phase to earlier. Uh, so delayed sleep wake face disorder is then when the sleep phase is um, gets very much later so that these people fall asleep very late and cannot wake up in the morning and go to work or go to school. So uh, the bright light there is really to help shift back the, the circadian rhythm. Um, but then light in the evening might be problematic because then you're shifting uh, it even later. Uh, and so there's been a discussion whether these devices uh, the light from these devices, which is mainly blue light, uh, is affecting the circadian rhythm and is making people feel feel awake and then they cannot fall asleep. So it's actually a, two different effects there. So it might be a direct effect on uh, people's melatonin um, and so feeling more awake in the evening because they have this bright light right in their face. Um, and the other effect might be that it's actually shifting their circadian rhythm to later and so that would lead to them not being able to fall asleep and delaying their their bedtime um, so, so serena just on that then because I'm, I'm aware of like people like sean kane and andrew phillips who've done some work on this at monash university and um i um i believe they have found in their studies that this like like a, the exposure to light um at certain wavelengths blue light and so on Will actually delay um, the DILMO, the DLMO, the delayed um, right. Like I always forget this. This DILMO, the uh, the timing of dim light melatonin onset. Yeah. So is so the light is shifting this melatonin onset further, and then that's yeah. actually delaying their ability to fall asleep. And then does that then go on to shift their circadian rhythm then because of that late night exposure and the shift in the melatonin onset? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um and and so that's what these experimental studies coming out from around 2010 were looking at um and some of these studies were actually looking at the uh, melatonin and the circadian rhythm but they were not necessarily looking at sleep uh which is quite interesting so they were actually seeing a in a link between being exposed to a bright screen and then uh, a shift in melatonin or the melatonin being suppressed. Um, but they weren't measuring sleep, which is really what we want to get at. But later studies were measuring both. And what's really, really interesting is that they were seeing a shift, um, but they were not seeing a significant impact on the sleep. So these mm. people um, did have a shift in uh, in um the melatonin curve but then they took 10 minutes longer to fall asleep max and so this is like this is what we call a sleep onset latency so you might take 20 minutes to fall asleep but my exposure to light i might be 30 minutes or 35 minutes but yeah. that doesn't then account for maybe i sleep for 10 hours and you only sleep for six yeah um true i'm these were um uh, lab studies so uh, I think um, not all of them but some of them did a really really strict protocol where people were coming in for five days so really looking mm -hmm. at okay what happens with continuous exposure to uh, the screen light um, and, and so they were also controlling the opportunity the time in bed and exposing to light before their bedtime and really seeing what happens uh, when they try to fall asleep so they try to fall asleep at the same time does it take longer or shorter to fall asleep and that's where the 10 minute difference was um so and, and the interesting thing is also that this has been studied in many different situations both in the lab at home um with different uh, age groups and um slightly different uh, comparisons for example a bright screen versus a book or um, a bright screen with or without the blue light filter so many different variations and the results are pretty consistent okay so the other aspect then as well as that people say that maybe you know and i think you call it here the arousal hypothesis so this is like it's the type of um you know, activity. Uh, I think there's been some research in young adolescents around violent video gaming. This often then leads to obesity, 
um, sleep problems, behavior problems, and so on. I know many people in professional roles will often be um, on their laptop in the evening, doing emails, maybe open up a spreadsheet, answering emails from an angry boss right. or an angry employee. And so yeah. many people, when they remove this type of arousal activity prior to bed, actually the sleep improves and they, and they feel better as well. And so it may just be uh, sometimes even independent of the sleep duration, it could just be better sleep quality or they feel less stressed as well. So mm. with this arousal hypothesis, is this impacting the sleep as well via these devices, such as via email or interaction in this regard? Um, yeah, so the, um, the the next question that you usually get is, is it the content then mm -hmm. um, or the content and device? So um, there have been studies, as you were mentioning, looking at video games, um, looking at um, so social media in, in some ways um, versus relaxation. So many different comparisons there. Um, and the effects are very similar to the ones of the bright light. So in, in this case, the arousal, so they've been measuring arousal, for example, um, with uh, heart rate, heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. And there you see sometimes that people are more aroused and sometimes they are not. So there is a lot of variations there in the, in the results. But when it comes to sleep onset latency, it's very similar, max 10 minutes difference when you look at something that should be arousing and something that should be relaxing. So not big effects there either. Yeah, and I think this it's is interesting. Sorry, I just say parenthesis because you were mentioning work and I don't think there are that many studies looking at work related uh, things uh, so or, or at least not experimental studies and so that's a really interesting area where we should definitely do more because um, work but even school work for younger people because that's really something that they mention as a big reason for mm -hmm. having a hard time falling asleep yeah i had christopher barnes on recently who's a professor in the u.s and he's done some work in this area now his area is more about organizational psychology looking at leadership behaviors and so on and he's done some sleep work there as well and he actually found i think it was a self-reported study but um if i could be wrong so we, i might as go back and check those papers and listen to that podcast i generally am wrong <laughs> um but he found like late nighttime activity um with smartphones actually impacted leadership behavior the next day. So they were more irritable. And even the employees themselves or the team members read that person as being a bit of a bit of an asshole the next day, really. It's kind of the mild, mild way of putting it. You know? So they, they weren't very engaging. So engaging behavior was down the next day. So, but you're dead right. There's limited studies. And the advice I often give to people is that if you find your sleep has been impacted or you want to improve your sleep, maybe start moving that sort of activity earlier back into the evening and giving yourself a break and and test it yourself an hour, 90 minutes, two hours to see what happens. I know right. for me personally, if I'm on email or any sort of work thing, I become really aroused from like just mm -hmm. kind of thinking about it because it's such a, a high a detail level of work that we do in science. Mm -hmm. so your brain starts firing. Yeah. Um, but if I'm sitting back watching like even mixed martial arts or UFC or Formula One, which can be quite arousing for some people. I'm 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 cool with that. Like I'm I'm mm. actually relaxed watching that. I can go to sleep. But if yeah. I had my emails out, that would like just make me, you know, mm. really, you know, stirred yeah. up and alert. So mm. I think it comes back to what you were saying earlier on that there's lots of variation, and yeah. we are we yeah. are. This is a biological subject. We're not like some piece of machinery where we have inputs and outputs, and we just dial one thing and it changes for everybody. Mm. What what affects one person may not affect another. Yeah, is yeah. that fair to say? And yeah, and also, yeah, definitely. And also the complexity of reproducing this in the lab, because you might be multitasking and doing a lot of different things. I'm thinking about teenagers chatting here, looking at TikTok while watching a TV series. I think when we had them in the lab, it was like really boring. They just had two yeah, things yeah. to do. So <laughs> that's really not close to what they are actually doing. Um, but just as an example, um, I think there was a really cool study that they did um, where they compared watching a TV series with a cliffhanger versus a TV series oh, yeah, without yeah. a cliffhanger. And uh, the people that watched the TV ser t series with a cliffhanger actually fell asleep faster, which I think is really, really fascinating. Uh, because really? Because we, we all think that, oh, okay, that's definitely going to be uh, arousing and they are not going to be able to fall asleep. You're going to think about, oh, what's going to happen next time? But it didn't. 
So some people often report as well, then Serena, that if I watch an episode with a cliffhanger, I have to start watching the next episode. Mm -hmm. Then that leads to another episode. And all of a sudden it's midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Like, yeah. so this is like this kind of the activity to replace that sleep time, which we spoke about. Is that something that occurs a lot or is there studies looking at that? And that's, that's yeah, that's, that's the, the next kind of uh, mechanism that we are discussing in this paper, which is the sleep displacement. So instead of sleeping, you're doing something else. So you're pushing your bedtime later because you are, you keep watching, you keep doing more what more, you're doing yeah. on your um on your devices so uh, and and that's where it's very interesting because that's where these individual differences come in so for example one of the things that have been looked at a little bit more is self-control which makes a lot of sense so <laughs> the ability to control your impulses uh, the the better you are at that the, the less you do this pushing your bedtime, watching another episode. But if you are poor at self-control, then of course you're going to Ooh. keep watching. Serena, are you recommending that people actually have some discipline? <laughs> yes, which is really hard <laughs> when you're a teenager, especially, and your brain is not really mature enough. But yes. <laughs> well, I think this is the same for adults now, because I, I, I make a joke of this in, in, in talks, and I've said this in a podcast before. Many people ask me how to improve children's sleep or even to improve their own sleep. And so if it's adults, I often use the example of a child. What do you do with a three or four year old from dinner time onwards? And, and the adult will say, Oh, the kid has dinner. Maybe we play with the child for a little bit of time. Then we have a shower or a bath. We read a story. We have some quiet time. We put on a nightlight, maybe some music. We make sure the room is, you know, nice and comfortable. And then they go to sleep. Yeah. And I was going, does the kid sleep? Oh, yeah, like 10, 11 hours, no problem. Now, what do you do to go to sleep? And they go, well, once that's done, then I put on a load of laundry. My, <laughs> my husband and I have our dinner or my wife and I have our dinner. Then we'll sit down and watch a show. But I need to catch up on some emails. So we'll open up our laptops. And, you know, you got to have a drink because it's been stressful. And so yeah. we'll have our dinner. We'll have a drink. And we'll do some emails. I might put on a show on Netflix. Something easy that we can watch in the background. And then I might say, do you eat any more food? Well, we'll just have some dark chocolate because dark chocolate is healthy. So now you look at, they've got dark chocolate, which is very high in caffeine. Yeah. They've got <laughs> alcohol. So this is counteracting the caffeine. They've got the stimulating activity of whatever they're doing for work, plus the bright light exposure, plus they may have the arousal content of what's going on on the TV. And then it's like one more episode. And then they'll say, you know, and I go to bed at 11 and then I wake up at five in the morning to exercise. So how can I get more than eight hours of sleep? And I'm like, well, all that stuff you're doing before sleep is not very good. Plus, you're not even allowing eight hours in bed. So it's really interesting when we start kind of breaking it down or reverse engineering out these things that people are doing, the light globe goes off for many people and they go, oh yeah, yeah, maybe I should mm. just stop doing that. So it yeah. comes back to what you are saying about discipline and making some rules. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, there are some things that could help um, just being aware then, uh, oh, all right, yeah, what I'm doing might not be that good for, for my sleep. Yeah, yeah. Um, or being aware of this, you know, YouTube suggesting the next episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can remove that and try to um, to limit these temptations. Um, yeah, so I, I think we'll talk about that a bit later, but I think there are some things that you can do to help this self-control as well. And like what you were saying with the parents, I think they're they're so important. Even if the the teenagers are getting older and they can do things by by them, themselves and they can decide a lot of things, but teenagers do say that they won't help with their sleep. So I think that as parents, we can actually step in and and help them out with with these routines because it's still very hard. Is there any evidence that says that maybe, or have you looked at this, that maybe sleep was better in, I don't know, and you you may you you may have been young at the time, but um as was I, but with any evidence to say maybe like in 1985 when people just had televisions and like when I grew up in Ireland, TV would stop at a certain time. Mm -hmm. So the, the TV station would close down at midnight or 1am, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it wouldn't start till three o'clock in the afternoon. And for us to watch TV 24 seven, we had to tune into English channels. Mm -hmm. So some people might have often said, oh, back in the seventies and eighties, like when we had TV that closed down and we didn't have the internet and all that, people mm -hmm. slept way better. And now because yeah. of all these devices, we have less sleep. Is there any 
Did any was there any studies that looked at that back in the nineteen eighties or seventies? Yeah, there there are some studies looking at trends over time. Um, but I, if I remember correctly, there are a lot of um different results there. So mm. some studies do show that there is a decline over time uh, and some studies show that it's actually very stable. And then there are also differences in different regions. Like I think Scandinavia has been quite stable. So that's really interesting uh, compared to other countries, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, we do have the light during the summer. So that's a bigger challenge, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I don't think that there is a clear very clear trend which you would expect because you know what you're saying makes a lot of sense that we didn't have the opportunity to to stay up before um but yeah i remember listening to um when i was listening to reading this or documentary and like i have a bit of interest in history and they were talking about when the radio came out first they thought that the radio was going to completely corrupt society that people would just stay up all night and all day listening to the radio and not going to work and do anything. It's like little did it know, you know, of like the radio is so benign really compared to all these things we have today. What's so coming, it's, yeah. What's coming, you know, so it's interesting. And, and who knows what will come in the future that may impact our sleep. But I think mm. you do raise an interesting point already, which is we can have all these things, but we must exercise discipline. And I think it's mm. the same with lots of things, alcohol, food, working too much, sleeping too much, exercising too much, whatever it might be. We need to find yeah. that middle ground, you know, we need to have mm. some discipline. Yeah, yeah, it go. It really goes back to these good routines, and yeah. like with TV, that's the same thing because that's we thought that TV was also really a problem <laughs> and not have it in the in the bedroom, and people were not really listening. Many people still have the TV in the bedroom because they want to, and mm. the same is with this technological device. It's even easier now with you know smartphones. They're so tiny; it's easy to take them in bed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, mo they're mobile, yeah. Hey, Serena, in this paper, you come up with this, um, and I've never seen this term before, but under the sleep displacement hypothesis, you talk about um, kind of, uh, I suppose, three stages here. Bedtime, deciding to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Then you have sleep onset time. But in between this, which I've never heard before, I, I don't know if it's ever been out or you just made this up. But, and if you did, that's brilliant. Should I time or should I latency? What's this? Yeah, so it's 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 not it's not me, it's not us. Okay. It's um um uh, Liz Exelmans. She's been really active in in this area, uh, together with I think uh, he was her um supervisor, uh, Jan van van der Balk, and uh, so they've come up with this two step, um two step model, um of displacement where you uh, use technology before going to bed so for example after dinner um a little bit like what you were describing uh so you you use technology there and then you decide to go to bed so you brush your teeth and uh, you get ready for bed you go in bed and then you pick up the phone again and use it a little bit more until you actually decide to go to bed so that's the two step is the pre bedtime and then it's the shut eye latency, which is actually the time it takes you to decide to actually attempt mm -hmm. sleep. And so that's really important when asking people about their sleep, because if we ask them, when did you go to bed? Then we might think that it took an hour for them to, to fall asleep, but actually they did not attempt sleep until much later. So it's really important to ask these different questions. Um, if we want to get good self-report of their sleep onset latency, for example. Yeah, this is that's that's a very interesting thing because so many people are guilty of doing that, including myself. Um, so yeah. with, with this as well, because you just highlighted there about smartphone use and so on, and many people are using mm -hmm. apps to help them sleep, maybe for storytelling, right. Cam, mm -hmm. this Cam app. Um, people are using many different things. I, one guy actually told me recently, do you know what he does to fall asleep? This is really bizarre. He puts on YouTube old Formula One races. And he likes the sound of the commentary and the... Yeah. That actually helps him relax and he falls asleep. So much so, he said, that when he watches a live Formula, Formula One race, he falls asleep. Oh, so he's so built this kind of like, you know, this kind of um, dependency on this background noise for that. But it leads into an interesting question because this comes up a lot. Are podcasts bad for sleep? 
you know, is radio bad for sleep? Is music bad for sleep? Mm. And I keep coming back and I say to people, it depends on the arousing content, because if you're listening to a heated debate on a podcast, then that's going to be an effect. Me personally, I've always listened to talk back radio. So I like a very soft spoken discussion, maybe on history and um, not politics um, you know, very kind of easy to listen voices, no screaming, no shouting and no laughing, no comedians, things like that. I just like these kind of history podcasts, what I like, or maybe discussions about philosophy. And I find he's very relaxing, particularly a middle-aged British man talking seems to just send me <laughs> off to sleep. So maybe those middle-aged British men are boring me to sleep, but it actually works for me. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, another interesting point because, um, of course, there are differences. And I think um, Meg Pillion, um, PhD um, student of Michael Gradisar, and she's now uh, Dr. Meg Pillion, she did a lot of research about different apps. So uh, are different apps more or less um, affecting sleep and she did see some differences so for example music which is something that a lot of teenagers like to listen to before falling asleep seems to be fine tv doesn't seem to have a big impact but youtube tiktok those are the ones that mm. are more linked to to uh, shorter sleep duration um, later bedtimes and so there are really differences there and i think we should focus on that because we cannot say don't take your phone into the bedroom but we should really talk about what do you think is um taking the time from your sleep mm. if you listen to music can you fall asleep but if you watch youtube is it is it yeah. so that you continue watching and that's disturbing your sleep? So making these differences, I think, is really important so that individuals can really try to stick to the ones that are helping them sleep and not using the ones that are really keeping them mm. awake. So it's really down to every person, you know, and what they want to decide to use or not use, what's going to help them. So it's going to be a bit of a bit of a shopping trolley you got to put in different things that are going to help you and take out the things that are not going to help you really going forward so it's very interesting again we're not going to have this black and white answer from this conversation today but i think what it highlights is these different areas that people can look at um yeah and look i i'm just as guilty of it you know um and i, I think many scientists are like for the last couple of months i've been learning how to play the piano so i've become somewhat obsessed with learning piano and and um about maybe two or three nights ago, my wife said, Shoot, I'm going to bed early. I generally go to bed between nine and half nine and get up between five and six in the morning. And dinner and I, I just wasn't tired. And she went to bed maybe a half hour, 20 to nine, a bit earlier. So I thought, I'll just go over to YouTube and look at some of those videos I've saved to watch later. So I started watching these little things like, you know, I only have five, six, seven minutes, how to play the piano better, um, tips for beginners, five songs you should learn. Dude, next man was like, oh no, it's 20 past 10. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> but in my mind, it was like two minutes, right? But it was just so easy because it was recommended. I just click, 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 and it was on the smart TV. Um, you know, and this was in the sitting room, not in bed, but it goes exactly to your point about these things can displace the sleep time and, you know, delay that sleep time as well. And yeah. we're humans. We're all, you know, we're all prone to this and we're by no means perfect. So, but now I've identified that and went, I'm not watching YouTube piano stuff before I go to bed because I just became like, boo, boo, boo. And also yeah. as well, this this is another really weird thing as well for, and this only stopped maybe two or three nights ago. Um, I've been practicing the piano anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours a day. Now I break it up across the day, you know, like in the morning, maybe lunchtime and so on in the evening. Yeah. And on the weekend yeah. play a lot. I have been dreaming because I'm learning to read music. I have been dreaming of learning to read music and try to yeah. coordinate my hands playing the piano and read at the same time for approximately three weeks straight every single dream had that content so cool. and i found it very it is cool but i found it very i was very tired the next day i found it very arousing and not very relaxing and it's only the last few nights that stopped so this is another thing that that content during the day or this acquisition of it's a new skill or this thing is actually you know really promoting me and even though i stop at like six or seven in the evening it's still having an impact on my sleep so now i have to stop before dinner or else i'm going to be just like mm. shaking at night time yeah yeah, yeah. 
Right. And and that's also a an interesting point because uh, what we are saying in this review is also that the the things that we do before our bedtime, that our sleep is pretty resilient, it seems, because you know what we discussed about the bright light and even the the arousal. But if we go after our, our bedtime, then that's when you see these effects and probably mm. because you're getting more and more tired and so you don't have this you know the the self-control doesn't kick yeah. in because you're tired and so it's easier to just keep watching and just keep doing uh what you're doing and we're not very good at problem solving or regulating our emotions and behaviors when we're <laughs> tired so <laughs> yeah. uh, that makes it worse yeah and many people would say even like you know, I stayed up last night till 10 or 11 o'clock to try and solve a problem. I couldn't solve it. But the next day I opened up my laptop and I was like, oh, there's the problem. It's because we get tired and we get into this kind of downward yeah. cycle and we can't, we can't problem solve. Yeah. Serena, we've got so many things to talk about in this paper, but I want, I'm going to jump forward actually a few, a few areas and just look at some of the protective factors. So we've obviously spoken about self-control. So this is, this yeah. is a protective mechanism that we can do going forward. So this is, can we, can we, can we just give you a, bit of a summary about what self-control may be? Yeah, so um, so self control is the ability to um, regulate um, impulses, and so um, we know that there is a trait self control. So some people are better at self control than others in general, uh, but also there is a, a self control that it's kind of built in and you know we wake up in the morning we've charged the batteries we have more self-control and towards the day then this uh, decreases and as I mentioned before uh, Liz Exenmans uh, has done a lot of really great studies in this area um, but it seems that the trait self-control so the individual differences uh, have a little better evidence out there um, that they are affecting sleep rather than this battery that is being used throughout the day. Um, so that kind of uh, mechanism. And then um, I think I mentioned before the fact being aware of um, technological companies have their own interests. They are interested mm. in us watching the next episode or uh, keep watching, looking at uh, ads and whatever. So being aware of these things might also be helpful in, you know, recognizing um, that, yeah, technology is made for us to keep clicking. And so just being aware might be helpful in thinking uh, and saying, okay, no, I'll stop now. Yeah, um, yeah. And the other thing that we discuss, I think it's um, parents or adults helping out and setting rules because that has some evidence out there, both um, looking at, for example, Wi-Fi rules that Wi-Fi is going to uh, stop at a certain hour or uh, technology use is not coming to the bedroom or whatever rules that a family might have um, are really helpful for teenagers. Um, and uh, it, it usually so shows a, a, a good link with, with better sleep. But then again, there are not that many intervention studies, uh, which would be really interesting to see because mm -hmm. is it, it might also be that it's easier to set these rules for a teenager that doesn't have a big problem with their technology use and sleep rather than a teenager who has trouble falling asleep and really needs it, their technology and maybe they don't have very good self-control and then yeah, they keep yeah. watching so um that would be really interesting to look at further serena on this journey did you find any relationship between the amount of let's say stressful activity via electronic device or not during the day and the impact on the sleep um needs of a person so for example what i'm thinking about is some people report that you know, on, let's say, retreats, meditation retreats, yoga retreats or other things as well, or to go away on holidays and to sort of unplug from the normal day to day, that their sleep need tends to go down because they don't have the stressors of the day um, or the electronic device use as well. Did you see any evidence of this in any of your studies or is, is it something that popped up or not? Mm, that's interesting. No, we didn't really... Um... Also, we were really focusing on evening technology mm -hmm. use, but that's an interesting thought. I also had a student, I think, telling me that, um, why don't you look at how much you use technology throughout the day? Because if you are not able to use technology throughout the day, 
you might feel a bigger need to use it in the evening because you have to catch up with all of these things and yeah. then uh, so yeah that would be really interesting too yeah because i know i know numerous people have said about that you know that basically it, mm -hmm. it, you know if they can dial down the stress during the day which is interesting because then we kind of get into a different area but it's like is the sleep pressure the sleep drive related not just to hours of wake and other factors as well and we know like when people are sick or do lots of activity this will increase the sleep pressure effect it, but what effect does like stress have on it as well so if we dial down the stress does it reduce that sleep pressure that sleep need for people as well so it's an interesting one to look at and i think um yeah what you're saying there is interesting one as well because some people then have, like you said have to catch up um mm. the biggest thing i've done is actually i got rid of twitter and facebook and it freed up, I would say, at least an hour a day for me. And that's why I replaced that with learning the piano. And it's far more enjoyable. Oh, that's... Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's that's why I did. very nice. Yeah. So mm -hmm. instead of like arguing with idiots on Facebook who are like me, I just stopped. Because <laughs> I had no self-control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's really the thing that if you know that, then... Yeah. There are things you can do. It's hard, <laughs> but um, yeah. And I, I think it's also like take it stepwise. So it, are you able to take your phone, put it in the kitchen and then go to bed? That's really great. But if you know that that's uh, too big of a step for you, then you can take it, the phone to the bedroom, but you put it away so that you don't reach it with your arm during the night. Because yeah, yeah. we haven't talked about the during the night things because of course it might be that the phone is disrupting sleep during the night if you have ringers on or yeah. if, even if you wake up and you're tempted to just Check have a phone. look yeah yeah because i mean um for example for me i'm working a lot with people in australia and then i want to i know that i will have an email in there because they usually come during the night yeah, so yeah. i know i did i i shouldn't do that <laughs> yeah and i think you're right it's about like yeah, putting some rules in place. I'm surprised how many people will have notifications on all night, just going bing, bing, bing. I'm like, that would yeah, drive me crazy. To do. Yeah, just Turned put the silent on. Yeah, so it's bizarre. So I, I put my phone on silent because I use it as an alarm clock as well and listen to maybe a podcast. I put it on silent, but I put a face down so the light doesn't come up mm. and there's yeah. no notifications. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that would be crazy. Anyway, I remember when BlackBerry, do you remember the BlackBerry device? Yeah. When the BlackBerry device first came out in business, and would have been would have been maybe two thousand and five or six. Mm -hmm. And it was really any kind of senior leaders had it. And I remember one senior leader, because the BlackBerry used to have a little light that would flash, a little red light on it that would flash. Right. Mm -hmm. And that would wake this person up twenty to thirty times a night because mm -hmm. the red light flashed. And so every time it flashed, they felt the need to get up and check the phone. Oh. And they got really like sick from doing mm -hmm. this they were like they looked really bad and they were only made by 31 32 years of age and they were checking this every night i was like that is ridiculous turn mm -hmm. it off or leave it in another room someone can ring your home phone if there's an emergency at work mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> crazy yeah and that's also the thing with you know rules and stuff we we didn't really call people at home after nine o'clock but now with these phones it's really easy to just send a message send a, a video or whatever yeah. and yeah so we talked to teenagers about can discuss with your friends that after 10 p.m maybe don't send anything if it's not really important because then you don't have to check yeah even though you're trying to go to sleep yeah if someone sends me a message after eight o'clock i'm like what are you doing send me a message this hour tonight it's like 8, 8 p.m <laughs> is too late for me and um, serena you discussed some public health implications here as well you discussed like matt walker's book and um, you've got a great a great graph in here as well that shows basically um the increase in technology device use since basically 1908 right through till today smartphones tablets um electricity obviously well from 1908 it's obviously electricity that, that we have not not smartphones in 1908 but you've highlighted this and the the it's like just it just looks like a line going straight up on the paper you know mm -hmm. so these things are here to stay are, are going to get more and and i think the, the other thing as well as you know a few years ago we might have had one device now we have multiple devices you know ipads smartphones there's all sorts of electronic interfaces as well. Um, you know, many people now have, you know, different cars that have electronic, you know, dashboards and interfaces. So there's all this kind of electronic devices everywhere we go, smart TVs, HD, 4K, 
it's just everywhere. So um, yeah. this is going to continue, I think, to increase. So from a public health perspective, what can governments or public health organizations look at? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think um, giving good information, you know, about uh, the fact that, because I mean, I, I think it's pretty positive, the fact that it's not really the bright light, it's probably not really the content, we need to do more research, but it doesn't seem to be that, but it seems to be when um, we go beyond our bedtime. So really talking about then it's really in your control. You mm -hmm. can do something about it, um, which is, of course, it's tough, but it's also you're in control and you can do something about it. Um, so, I mean, technology is also uh, finding really good ways to help us, to help our sleep. So, for example, uh, there is silent mode. Um, there is a possibility that YouTube will stop with these suggestions to keep watching because we know that that's really detrimental for many people, especially young people. So I'm, I, I guess that working with the tech companies could be very helpful as well. Um, so yeah, just giving good information that it's based on evidence and maybe talk to these tech, tech companies and, you know, make them <laughs> work a little bit more for our health rather than uh, their benefits. That would be really, really helpful. But that's an interesting area because you spoke there at the start of this conversation about having an interest in psychology. And so one of the interesting psychology models that we'll often learn in organizational psychology is ILOC and ELOC, internal locus of control and external locus of control. And so Stoicism follows similar patterns to this, as does Buddhism and Taoism. And I think this is really interesting. We can externalize this and say it's the tech company's fault. It's the smartphone company's fault. It's the government's fault. It's, you know, it's this, that, and the other. Oh, in China, they turn off TikTok for a certain amount of time. We can do all that. Mm -hmm. But it's we need to look back and see what's inside our control. And exactly this conversation we're having, you don't have to pick up that phone. You can turn it off. You can leave it in a different room. You can delete that app. You don't have to have a Facebook or YouTube account. No one is forcing you to do this. You can set the rules around it yourself. So there's many things within in your control that we can take away from this conversation today. Yeah. And again, it comes back to what you were saying, Serena, about having some discipline around this. It might be difficult, but it is effective. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Serena, what's next for you? Um, actually, before we talk about what's next for you, um, this paper is in the link. Um, below on the show notes. We have only discussed uh, probably 20, 30% of this paper. There's lots more in here. Next steps for qualitative research, research agenda, um, qualitative studies and so on, and lots more in here. So please have a look at this paper. It's not behind a, a paywall. Feel free to share it with friends and so on. But for you, uh, Serena, personally, what are you working on next over the next sort of 12 to 18 months? What's your research focus? Yeah, so uh, in part, it's uh, this intervention in schools uh, that I am working on, but also finishing up these studies that I did um, at um, in Adelaide. Um, I think they really should be out there because uh, it's been really fun to to do these studies. And so I'm uh, planning to present them in Seville in uh, September. So hopefully. What at European um, sleep? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so really trying to finalize those results and get them out there. Excellent. And will you be coming to the Australasian Sleep Association this year or taking a break? Uh, I'm a bit too far, I guess. A bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about going to Spain this year, actually, as well, but I'm just extremely busy with work and I'm going on holidays in, in August, September to Japan. Mm -hmm. So I decided maybe a holiday is better and then I will, um, but I would like to go to European state. I've heard it's very good, the conference. So I would like to get to it some year. Where is it? Where is it next year? Where is it or next time? I'm not sure. I have to look not it up. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I was quite, I was quite interested in going to Spain this year. Um, yeah. yeah. So I have to have a look and see. Uh, Serena, if anybody wants to follow your work, get in contact with you, maybe do some research or maybe even give you a few million dollars to do research. How can they get in contact with you? Um, they can contact me on uh, LinkedIn. I'm a bit more active there. I'm not super active on social media, but uh, I, I like LinkedIn. Uh, and of course, they can email me. Um, 
they can easily Google my name and find me at um, Örebro University. Excellent. Dr. Serena, thank you very much for being on the Sleep Performance Podcast. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you.